Greetings, Leica fans and Leica fam, and welcome to another installment of Leica Conversations. Uh, my name is Antonio Benedetto, product specialist for Leica Camera USA, and thank you again for joining us for another installment of Leica Conversations. We're so happy to have you here, and we're so happy to jump right into today's programming. Uh, so today, uh, the man who's going to be in the driver's seat for us today is Brad Husick. Uh, Brad is a fourth generation photographer, a tech entrepreneur, uh, and now vice president of the International Leica Society, LHSA. Welcome, Brad. Thank you so much for being here. Antonio, thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And on behalf of the Leica International Society and um, LHSA, and I want to thank you, Leica Camera and uh, Leica Academy for inviting me today. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to begin by going over just what we're going to cover today in our one hour together. Uh, encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A function, uh, and then uh, we'll get started. So today, this session is really targeted at those of you who either would like to get started using Lightroom or perhaps had a prior experience with Lightroom, maybe a frustrating one getting started with it. Um, and I want to give you some guidance about what Lightroom is good for, why you, why you might want to choose to use it, and then how to get started with organizing your photographs, learning more about your photography by using Lightroom, and also how to edit your photos. Now, normally, that would take several sessions to do, uh, but yes. we're going to try to condense here, right? Um, so what is Lightroom? Why should you care about Lightroom? What I have found is there are lots of tools out there for uh, managing your photographs. But what I have found over the many years I've used Lightroom from version one to version 10, which just came out yesterday, uh, is Lightroom is a wonderful way to keep track of your photographs, to organize your photos, to make sense of that organization, and to edit your photos and either print them or export them for other purposes. So. That's what Lightroom is. It's a great way to do that. It's very scalable. Um, I have a Lightroom catalog with over 280,000 photographs of mine in it. And uh, it doesn't slow down at all when you've got that many pictures in. Lightroom's actually capable of handling millions of photographs at a time. So um, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. And I have some reference information to share with you that are uh, slides in, the, in that um, application. So I'm going to share my screen, and we will get started. I see some people are already asking some questions, so thank you. Uh, and someone asked, uh, should they have Lightroom open on your device? Feel free to have it open and you know, um, and try to follow along. Um, but yeah, go ahead, take it over, Brad. Thanks. Yeah, it's not necessary for you to follow along with this. I think um, it's better to watch what I'm doing and maybe come back in the recording that you can find on the Leica um, uh, YouTube channel um, mm -hmm. and refer back to that. Yeah, we'll so, have this all recorded and posted to Leica Camera USA's uh, YouTube page. Great. So this is Lightroom. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to import a folder of my photographs to start because it's got some information in that that I want to share. So there's a button down here in the lower left. Antonio, you can see the full screen, right? Yes, we're all good. Great. So I'm going to hit the import button and then choose where from my computer I'm going to import these photos. And I'm just going to choose editable JPEGs here with, that's on my desktop. And Lightroom gives you a thumbnail preview of all those photographs. And I'm just going to say, OK, I just want to add those photos to my catalog. A catalog is the database of your photos and press the import button. And this is a very quick process because Lightroom doesn't move your photos or copy your photos to another location. It just references those photos wherever they are. And that's a really important concept. You don't have to change the way you organize your photos on your computer to use Lightroom. Lightroom can adapt to you. So I have these 27 photographs that I've now imported. And I just want to begin by sharing some references with you about information that you can get about Lightroom that will answer some of your questions that you might have. So to start, there are several versions of Lightroom out there. And this, is, this can be confusing to some people. So there is a Lightroom that's available for the desktop. 
which is called Lightroom Classic. And that's the application we're using today, Adobe Lightroom Classic. There is a version of Lightroom for mobile devices, and that's simply called Lightroom without the word classic on it. Uh, so you can, you can get Lightroom from Adobe through a couple of different monthly plans. The one that most people find useful is this middle plan, the photography plan. It gives you access to Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, Photoshop, the, the full Adobe Photoshop, and Photoshop on iPad and other applications, in addition to 20 gigabytes of cloud storage provided by Adobe. If you need more cloud storage, you can always add. They have a photography plan that gives you a terabyte or um, a basic Lightroom plan, which doesn't give you Lightroom Classic, what we're using today, or Photoshop on the desktop. Um, so I recommend this middle photography plan for most people. It's now, deal. And also, I'll just jump in and just add that we've got a question uh, about if someone's still using Lightroom 6, um, I would, I mean, maybe Brad, if you agree, I would advise uh, it's time to upgrade uh, and look into these subscription plans. I agree, Antonio. Um, Lightroom, the reason to subscribe is at the end of the day or at the end of the year, you'll actually spend less money on the subscription than you would have upgrading to each new version as we did in the past. I remember the upgrades were something like $149. And doing that every year is actually more expensive than just getting the monthly plan. Mm -hmm. And you're getting the new features all the time by having the subscription. Yeah, it's kept up so, to date. And if you buy a Leica camera, you get three months comped, uh, which I believe should add to even if you have a current uh, a current. Yeah, and that's, that's a great deal. So um, definitely, I'd, I suggest moving from the standalone version to the, the new version, which is Lightroom Classic 10. Now, if you have questions about Lightroom um, that you want to get answered, there's a couple of places I go to answer my questions about Lightroom. Um, one of them is a, a website called The Lightroom Queen. Um, and she's written a book called Lightroom Classic, The Missing FAQ. Um, this is a wonderful book. Each page is dedicated to a single question that you might have about Lightroom. You don't have to read it cover to cover. You just go to the index, look for your question, and she's got the answer there. Um, it's a great resource. So I recommend it's available either, either as an ebook or available in paperback. So that's a Lightroom Queen. It's a great um, reference. Uh, the other place I, I like to go is uh, there's a woman named Julianne Coast. And Julianne is at Adobe. She is the imaging evangelist or Lightroom evangelist for Adobe. And Julianne has a series of YouTube videos that are um, up to 10 minutes long, but uh, typically about one to three minutes long. And her, her videos are crystal clear in explaining different ways to use Lightroom. So uh, Julianne's a, a, a great resource there. I recommend checking out her videos. All right, so let's get into Lightroom. What is Lightroom? Well, as I mentioned, it's a database for your photos. It's an organizational tool for your photos. And the basic user interface is over here on the left, we manage the location of our photographs. Over here in the middle, we have the previews of the photographs and ways to view your photographs in different ways and information about your photographs. And I'll get into each one of those. And on the right hand side, we have either an information list or when you click on these words at the top right, it changes the modules that you're using in Lightroom. These are the major functions. The library is the place where you're going to look at all your photos. The develop module is where we actually edit our photos. And then there's map functions and making books and slideshows and printing. So we're not going to have time to get into the maps and books and slides and printing today, but um, perhaps those are some things we could cover in future topics. So. I've, up, I've now imported these 27 photographs from that folder. I didn't create new versions of them. I didn't copy them from other locations. I just imported them from their existing locations. So if you have your photographs stored on various hard drives on your computer, there's no need to move or rearrange those photographs before you bring them into Lightroom. You can simply ask Lightroom to import them, and it will pull point to those photographs in the locations that they already exist. If you're bringing photographs in from a camera, 
you simply you take out the SD card, and I'm going to in, insert the SD card in my reader right now. This is from my Leica monochrome camera. And often Lightroom will automatically detect the fact that I've done that. But if not, I can hit the import button. Oh, it, it automatically detected. And you can see it's automatically selected this M mono card. This is the SD card. It doesn't show any photos because the photos are actually contained inside that one, the 100 like a photo. But if I say include subfolders, there you go. There are all the, all the photos that I've taken recently with this like a monochrome. And if I want to import them, all I have to do is say what I, what I want to happen here, which is I want to copy those photos from the card to a new location, which is actually my hard drive. And uh, on the right-hand side, I, there are a few things I typically choose. One is the previews. The default is standard, which is the, the entire size of this window. And that's a good default for the previews that it has. It speeds up Lightroom to have those previews already built. And you can apply different renaming of those files as they come in. I typically don't do that. But now here is where you choose where those photos are going to be. So if I want to put them in the same folder that I had my other photos in, I would go to my desktop and look for those editable JPEGs, that folder right there. That's telling the, the, the program, copy the photos to that folder. You don't have to copy the SD card outside of Lightroom first. You can use Lightroom to copy the SD card. So now all I do is press the import button and it's going to copy and add those files, those photographs to the database. So we will let that happen in the background and we'll come here into all photographs and just keep showing you what we've got. Those will come in and you can see that number um, increasing as we go. So that is the basic organization of how you bring photographs into Lightroom. Let me give you one caveat. Um, because Lightroom is a database and it's pointing to your photographs, you should resist the temptation to move those photos to different folders or hard drives outside of Lightroom. If you move them when Lightroom's not running, Lightroom will get confused and forget where those original photos are. Lightroom is a non-destructive program. So any edits you make to it don't change your original files. Those original files stay where they are. It just holds the instructions for those changes next to the files. So re please resist the temptation to get inspired one day and go and reorganize all of your hard drives outside of Lightroom. There's no need to do it. In fact, I have uh, some students that I work with who keep every single photograph they've ever taken in a single folder without any sort of organization whatsoever. And they use Lightroom to organize those photographs. And that's a, an approach that's actually working really well. So I'm gonna ask you to, to, for the moment, kind of forget about folder structures on hard drives and think just more about your photographs and ways to organize those photographs. I'll get to that in when we talk about collections. Okay. so. We've got photographs displayed here. We have thumbnails in the center. You can change the size of those thumbnails with a slider down here in the lower right-hand corner. And if I slide in this direction, I'm gonna get smaller thumbnails. And this direction, I'm gonna get larger thumbnails. I, I like kind of a mid setting for that so I can see more than a few at a time. Uh, if you wanna look at one of your photographs, all you have to do is double click on the image and that will zoom to the fit of the window. And you can see here it says fit. If you want to zoom to 100%, that is pixel for pixel, click one more time, and now it zooms to 100%. And depending on how large your file is, that can be this portion of the image, or it can be um, a much larger portion of the image. So uh, for example, on, on this photograph, which was taken on an M9, um, the fit is here, and then the zoom to 100% is actually zoomed in quite far. There are some new features that showed up yesterday in Lightroom that allow you to zoom by using holding down the shift key when you're in this view. I think it's shift, I believe. Um, and if you slide left and right by holding down that key, you can vary the zoom that you, uh, that you obtain in the program. 
If you hold down the command on the, on the Mac, you get this kind of uh, cursor, which allows you to draw a zoom rectangle around something you might be interested. And now the, the program zooms to that level. That happens to be 313.7%. Um, you can easily click here to go back to 100% or fit it to the window. Or you can zoom to any level that you choose by clicking the arrows here. And you can set in your own number here. So if you want to zoom way past 100%, um, it's very easy to do that. And those are some new zoom features that actually appeared yesterday in the new 10.0 version of Lightroom Classic. All right, so now we know how to zoom our photographs. So if we use the arrow buttons, the arrow keys on our keyboard, we can go to the next photograph or the, pre or the prior photograph. Um, pretty easy there. And uh, if you use the G key, that stands for grid. And if you press G, it will always take you back to this grid view. So that's one of the shortcuts I would, I would memorize is G for grid. Over here, it says we've got 89 photographs in our catalog now. That's increased because I brought in the SD card. Um, if you see fewer than your total number of photographs, it's probably because it's selected previous import. By default, after you do your import, it will show you previous import. And it's showing me the 62 photographs that I brought in from the SD card on my monochrome. So that uh, if you're not seeing all your photographs, just come back over here and click on all photographs and you'll see all of them um, in the order that you've got. Now the order of these thumbnails is controlled in the bottom center of the screen and it's here. Uh, I have it set to capture time. That is, when was the photograph taken according to the EXIF data that the camera records. But you can choose other ways to sort these thumbnails in this grid view. You can do them by name or extension or any other sort of rating that you've given them. Um, you can pick them up and move them around manually, but that is not going to stay uh, as a setting when you go to another view. So I would suggest not rearranging them manually. Choose one of the sort orders here. Um, it's, it's going to, that's going to be persistent as you use the program. Now, underneath the, the catalog that shows us all these photographs, it does show us the folders that it's pointing to on the computer. I actually don't find that terribly interesting um, because I'm not really interested in what folder it's in. I'm more interested in how I would want to organize my pictures. So I use the triangle on the left here to close whatever things I'm not looking at at the, at the current time. All right, so uh, in, in the view of your images, up here in the, cent in the center top, there are four choices here. Um, viewing no extra information, viewing text about the photograph, attributes that you've assigned to the photograph, or metadata in the photograph. Let's choose metadata for a moment. And it pops up whatever fields of metadata are available in the files that were recorded on the camera. So for example, the date the photograph was taken. I can see here that of my 89 photographs, uh, they were taken across many different years. So here's an automatic way to say, OK, I took pictures in 2013. Uh, maybe I took some in August. I want to see those. You don't, have to, you don't have to create a folder structure for that. Because this is a database, it's managing all that for you. So that's one way to look at your photographs. Uh, interestingly, in, in this collection of 89 photographs, I actually have 13 different cameras represented here. Um, some of my favorites, like the M10 and the Leica Monochrome, but you know, going all the way back to the, the M8, for example. Um, so this is an interesting way to see how your, photo, how your photography changes and what sort of photographs you take with what cameras. Um, lenses is another way to look at it. So what lens did I use? to take these photos. Um, what are my favorite lenses? So um, some of them are not recorded, so it, it's going down here in unknown lens. But for example, you know, which photograph did I take with the Elmerit 28 millimeter 2.8? Um, that's the photo that we used, one of the photos we used to promote today's session. And it, again, if I double click it, I get the full, the full window view of that photograph. Going back to the G key for my grid. Um, so the, this kind of metadata, here it says label, but we don't have to choose label. We could, for example, choose ISO speed. 
So uh, this particular photograph, because it's the one selected, was taken at ISO 200. But if I choose all, we can see there are 10 different ISO speeds. And I took a bunch at ISO 320, for example. Um, in my uh, Lightroom catalog of 280,000 photographs, I have something like 200 different cameras represented. I, I, I choose, I, I've used a lot of different equipment over the years and written a lot of reviews. Um, so I have something like 200 different cameras and 400 lenses. And um, it, it, it's a way to look at your photography and get a sense for, uh, for example, how I'm using my lenses. Let me give you a specific Leica example. Many of you might be familiar with the wide angle trielmar, the weight lens, or the MATE, M-A-T-E, the, um, uh, the medium uh, angle trielmar lens. Well, years ago, I purchased the wide angle, the weight, which is a 16, 18, 21 millimeter combination lens. And I used that for a while. It's a lovely lens. And then I looked back at my photography and looked just at the photographs I took with that lens. And I looked at the focal lengths I was using. And it turned out that about 90% of the photographs I took with the wide angle trielmar, I took at the widest setting, the, I believe the 16 millimeter setting. 16, yep, that's right. Um, and that told me something about my photography and my need for wide angle. And I ended up actually selling that lens and picking up uh, a, a different lens that was just a single focal length to achieve that goal. So these are ways that you can learn more about your photography using um, using Lightroom. Now I'll add one little thing too for a, a, a like a tidbit: the importance then of you know having uh, six bit coded lenses so that you if you're an M shooter like on this M10 monochrome, uh, you've got that little those little filled in with paint. Um, codes there uh, where that way the camera knows what what lens you have mounted so when I put this on the 35 Sumalux the camera knows it and it embeds everything in the EXIF data if you have older lenses uh, you don't have those um, it was the way that you know Leica figured out a way to, to make our old manual lenses or manual lens design and keep the lens not the same in digital you know where the lenses are just metal and glass it's a very in, in, ingenious way of, uh, of, of embedding EXIF data so the camera knows what you're shooting with. It's great, great. Thank you, Antonio, for mentioning that. Um, if you happen to have lenses that aren't six-bit coded, you can manually tell the camera, I'm using this kind of lens right now. Um, so I encourage you to do that when you mount a, a lens that doesn't have six-bit on it. Now, something that's really important about Lightroom is the way it can organize your photographs. And we do that not with moving around folders on a hard drive, but a concept that Lightroom calls collections. And collections are just logical groupings of photographs that make sense to you. So for example, I have lots of different kinds of photographs on here. Some of these are landscapes, for example. So perhaps I'd like to create a collection of landscapes. If I click on the plus symbol here, I can click create, create collection. I can name that obviously this case, in this case, landscapes, and create a collection for that. Right now it shows landscapes, no photographs in it. However, if I go to my library here, my grid, and I click on photographs that I think are landscapes, I can then command click on others to select them. And if I think it's a landscape photo, I'll click on all the ones I think are really landscapes. Let's just do those. And then use your mouse to simply drag them as a group into the landscape collection. It didn't move them on your hard drive. It didn't create new versions or new copies of those photos. It's just organizing the photos as landscapes. If I want to, for example, create a collection called People. Again, here's the collection. No photographs yet. But if I want to, I can click on the photographs that I have as people. Let's do a few of those. And I can drag those into the people collection. Now, as you probably saw, there's some overlap between landscapes and people. That's not a problem. I can have a photograph in more than one collection. And that's power 
that you don't get by organizing your photographs in folders on a hard drive. That's power you get using a database and this collections feature in Adobe Lightroom. I have a friend who's a photographer and a, a fly fisherman, and he likes to go out every year with a group of different friends to different rivers and catch different fish. He brings his photographs into Lightroom and he organizes them by collection. One of the collections is the name of the person he went fishing with. The other collection is what kind of fish he was catching. And another collection is uh, what river he was fishing. And he's got photographs in multiple collections, as you, as you can imagine. Lots of photos of, uh, pic of fish caught with bob, lots of salmon, um, lots on, on the Columbia River. Um, and so this is a logical way to organize your photographs and really keep track of them without having to worry about where they live on the hard drive. You can have nested collections. And to do that, you create a collection set. Think of that as the, uh, the drawer on the file cabinet, where the collections are actually the folders that you're keeping the, the, fo the photographs in. If I create a collection set, I can say these are my um, LHSA photos. And I can put these collections into a collection set just by dragging and dropping. Uh, there is only one level of hierarchy, by the way. Um, you can't have multiple levels of, of collection sets. So I strongly encourage you to take advantage of the collections feature in Lightroom to organize your photographs. And don't worry about where they're stored on hard drives. You can always change your mind and move photographs from one to another. If I click on the people collection, I get those eight photographs. If I click on the landscapes, I get those six photographs. If I want to see everything, I just click on all photographs. So we're at a logical uh, uh, transition point now from where I've introduced the interface, how to organize your photographs. And in the next section, we're going to get into how to edit your photographs. But I want to pause here and see if, Antonio, there might be a few questions that have come up. Oh yeah, we've got a great, a great array of questions. I've, I've been answering some with, uh, with, with direct messages uh, that I should show up for everyone in the answered section as well. Um, now, um, I think there's some that I think come, a lot of can be answered by the kind of your mileage may vary situations or everyone has their own interpretation. Um, someone asked, for example, uh, how do you, uh, do you recommend starting your folder and file organization for the first time, the structure of the storage? Brad, my, my first thought on that is it's kind of up to you, right? There's, there's many different ways you can, you can slice this. I, I agree, Antonio. I, I think simple is better. Um, what I typically do with my photographs is I start a new folder for each year of photographs that I'm taking. So I have all of my 2020 photographs in a single folder, and that folder is then imported into Lightroom. Yeah, and then like you said, from there, your collections will really be what would help you uh, go through. Um, yeah, it also, by the way, helps when you're backing up your photographs. Um, when you back up your computer outside of Lightroom, uh, it's way easier to back up a whole folder of photographs, you know, 2020, than it is to find all, all the different folders that you're looking for. Hmm. And uh, someone asked, uh, what are smart collections? Good question. A smart collection is a collection based on a set of rules, typically about metadata. So if I create a smart collection, I can set up a rule that says, I want a smart collection of, for example, all of my photographs taken with the M9. Yeah, that's a, it's a, something, again, you can really customize to your, your liking. Um, and I'll, again, add that, 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 that mention that Lightroom can do so many things and you don't have to use every single feature. It's all about kind of working into, you know, you're settling into your workflow and what works for you. Uh, the core of that, that Brad is showing you with, uh, with collections and, and importing and, and then what's coming next, um, it's kind of the, the key thing to, to build off of, especially if you're kind of still learning um, or getting settled in. Exactly um, right. Let me mention also, unlike other programs, like let's say you're using Word or, or Excel or something, that kind of program requires you to save a file. You either do a save or a save as. You've noticed I haven't done any save or save as here. 
even when I'm editing photographs, I don't have to do a save or save as. Because Lightroom keeps track of everything you're doing, the only time you need to actually move photographs outside of Lightroom is when you're sharing them for other purposes. You might be emailing them to someone, you might be uh, sending them to a printer, you might be putting them on an SD card to carry to someone else. That's the only time you're going to use the export feature, which is up in the file menu. So there's no need to think about, well, how often do I have to save my, my photo? When we get into editing, I'll show you, you don't have to ever say save. It, it's going to keep track of your changes and allow you to do several different versions of those changes, which we'll talk about. Yeah, that is a very, really, really good tip and, and something to kind of try and help you kind of wrap your head around how this catalog and, and, and how Lightroom works. Um, you know, so yeah, non-destructive editing is, is a key, key thing. You always just make a copy. Um, someone asked, uh, you mentioned you have 280,000 photos. Uh, how much storage does that use? And do you shoot and store in RAW? <laughs> Good question. Um, so I recently upgraded my external hard drive to a 14 terabyte drive. There's no way I need that much space. I have those 280,000 photographs occupy roughly five terabytes of, of storage. Um, the catalog, so th those are the originals. Those are the, the either the DNG or JPEG files. Uh, I, I shoot almost entirely in RAW. Um, I like the flexibility that RAW gives me. And because Leica cameras shoot in the DNG, digital negative file format, there's no conversions necessary. So um, Adobe Lightroom speaks DNG and Leica cameras speak DNG. So um, it, there's no, no worries there. Um, the catalog that actually is the index of all of these photographs, these 280,000 photographs, the catalog is probably a few hundred kilobytes in size. It's a very, very efficient program to index all those, those, those photographs. And uh, I'll add just uh, one more, uh, uh, some extra less time. I'll, I'll say how now we're getting a huge influx of questions. I know it's me tough. We're not going to get to all of them, but we'll keep, I'll, I'll keep uh, triaging them uh, for Brad. So everyone, thank you again. Um, the, uh, yeah, just preserve your catalog uh, fold uh, files. And uh, I'll add that I always shoot in raw as well. Um, and, you know, ultimately I've seen a couple of people commenting or asking questions about very old versions of Lightroom when it was standalone, not subscription based. Uh, and I'll just, I'm not here to, to pitch for Adobe, but ultimately, you know, if you, your, your Leica cameras are still compatible because as Brad mentioned, they use Adobe DNG raw. Um, but with every improvement to the newer versions of, of Lightroom, they're also making improvements to just general compatibility and performance. And, and your your older files can actually benefit and and from this the newer versions. Um, absolutely, so something, something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, when you have if you have an old version of Lightroom, and you decide to get the new version, Lightroom will automatically upgrade your catalog to work with the new program. So I just did that with my two hundred and eighty thousand photograph catalog. It took less than a minute to upgrade the catalog to work with the new version. Um, by the way, I, I tend not to discard or throw away my photos. Uh, and here's one reason. There are photos I took a decade or two decades ago that at the time, the, the software wasn't that good at processing. I've gone back to those photographs and reprocessed them in new versions and I've been able to rescue those photos and, and really improve them in ways I could never do before. And I'm actually going to show you that when we edit some photos. Cool. Uh, I think we should, yeah, we can move on to, to, to editing photos. The last question I want to ask is maybe a quick one. Uh, someone asked, when do you use keywords or do you use keywords uh, when you're also using collections? Great question. So um, keywording, as you can see, is over here on the right-hand side. And you can, if you're a fan of keywords, uh, Lightroom has a great way to manage your keywords. You can enter them simply by typing. You can assign keywords by simply dragging them onto the photographs. It will allow you to uh, reuse those keywords and make sets of those keywords. I'm actually not personally a, a user of keywords. I, I think it's effort that, to me, hasn't paid off in the long term. 
but over here on the right hand side, this is where you would do your keywording. Mm -hmm. And again, if one of those things where All right. everyone's got different I'm going to jump into editing. Sound yeah, go good ahead. with you? Please. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get, let's get further right. along in editing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it works well. I've seen it work well. Um, I'm, I'm just personally not a user of keywords. All right. So let's get into editing photographs. How do we do that? Well, let me give you some examples. So I, I talked about a, a photograph I took a long time ago. This photograph, um, if I double click, I get to see it in this window. If I want to edit the photograph, I choose the develop module up here on the top right. And now it shows me a whole bunch of different tools. And I'm going to walk through some of those tools and show you how to edit photographs in Lightroom. Uh, usually this is something that we take more time to do, but we're going to do it quickly here. Now, this is a photograph I took in Iceland um, more than a decade ago. That's my wife and my older son. He's 24 now, but I think he was six in this photograph. Um, and this was a photo I took pointing directly into the winter sun. Um, this was uh, the dead of winter. It was about 16 below zero. Um, and you can see it, it's it's kind of washed out. Um, the the I remember it being much more vividly blue at the time. I think the sun, shooting directly into the sun, kind of confused the camera. Um, so when I edit photographs, I, I follow a kind of a workflow. And I'm going to take, take you through that now. The first thing I like to do with the photo is, if I'm going to crop the photo, this is the time that I, that I crop it. So the crop tool is right here. It's this dashed rectangle. And if you click on the crop tool, it will show you, uh, by default, a rule of thirds um, index on here. Um, if you want to move that around, you simply pick up one of the corners and, and drag it around. You can change it to um, a vertical perspective. You can move the photograph underneath the rectangle and crop however you like. Um, if you want to, if, if the horizon is not straight and you want to straighten that out, um, you can move your mouse slightly outside of it and then rotate the crop. Um, if you want to crop to a specific aspect ratio, let's say you know you're going to print this as an 8 by 10 photo. If you click on this word custom, you can choose the aspect ratio that you're after, whether it's 16 by 9 or 4 by 6 or 8 by 10, and it will snap to that, uh, that ratio. And then you can drag this handle around and it will always be an 8 by 10, or if you get to the corner, a 10 by 8 ratio. I'm not going to crop this photo right now, so I'm just going to press the escape button. Uh, the next thing I do with my photographs is I like to go and see if there's any spots, dust spots on my sensor. Um, if you change your lenses in harsh conditions, sometimes you can get dust blowing in and landing on the sensor. So one of the cool tools in Lightroom is the spot removal tool. It's the next one next to the crop tool. And if you Typically, when you click on that, uh, it'll show you the photograph and the little spot removal tool. But if I click Visualize Spots down here in the lower middle, it gives you this very strange view of the photograph. If you slide this slider around, lighten up the photograph, and you can see, you see these little donuts in the sky? Each one of those donuts is actually a dust spot on the sensor. So this is a way for you to say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to change, I'm going to remove those dust spots in this view because it's easy to see them. So the way you change the size of the brush easily is with your keyboard, the square bracket keys. The left and right square brackets make the brush larger and smaller. And you just want it to be slightly larger than the dust spot. So I can quickly click, Lightroom knows pretty intelligently where to sample to replace what was under the dust spot. And I can pretty quickly click on my dust spots, the ones that I see. I think there's one actually down here in the photograph. And remove the dust spots. I can remove that visualize spots. And when I say done, or I press enter, I've now removed all the dust spots in that photograph quick and easy. You can actually apply, if you've taken lots of photographs in a session, you can actually apply those changes across multiple photographs with the sync function. I don't have enough time to show you that right now, but you can dust spot one photo 
And as long as you believe that the, the same dust exists on many, you can actually get rid of it in, in one click. So we've cropped, we've removed the dust spots. Now I'm really interested in editing the way the photo looks. As I mentioned before, I remember this being a lot more blue. Um, so I'm gonna look at the photograph from the standpoint of white balance. And the one thing we know about snow is that snow is pretty neutral. It's a pretty neutral gray, especially in the shadow areas. So one of the tools that Lightroom gives us is the white balance eyedropper. If I click on the white balance eyedropper and I choose an area that's in shadow, I don't really want to choose an area that's in sun um, because the sun is warm by itself. But if I choose an area in the shadow area of the snow and I click once there, you can tell this is the after, this is the before. You can tell that the photograph has already gotten cooler in, in white balance. The snow is more neutral. In fact, I probably want to go a little bit further and I just pick up the temperature slider and move it to the left because I really remember this minus 16 degree day as being quite cold and blue. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm happy with it now. Now, something else I'm noticing about the photograph is it's kind of washed out. I'm not getting the sort of contrast I was looking for. It's a little hazy. And one of the tools that Lightroom gives us is the dehaze feature. This showed up uh, in, in the last version of Lightroom, and I'm really glad because it's a very, very powerful tool. If I pick up the dehaze slider and I slide it to the right, what it's doing is a number of things at the same time. It's increasing mid midtone contrast. It's saturating the colors a little bit, and it's decreasing some of the exposure. And you can see, just by sliding that dehaze control, I'm gaining a lot in that photograph. The sky has really come back beautifully. So that's, uh, I want you to notice, this is an approach where I'm not just sliding things around willy-nilly. I'm looking at the photograph, trying to describe the problems I see in the photo in plain English and then translating that to which control that I'm using in, in the sliders over here. By the way, if you want to reset something to zero, just click on the name of the slider. So if I don't want the dehaze, if I double click that, it goes back to zero. You don't have to type the, the number zero in that. So there we go, we've dehazed that photograph. Now I'm noticing lens flare here, that, that oval of lens flare. I may want to leave it in the photograph, or if I'm interested in taking it out, Lightroom allows us to do changes on the photograph, not only on a global basis, which we've done so far, but also on a local basis. And the local editing tools are found right here in this bar. We used one already, it was the spot removal tool. The next one is the red eye reduction tool. If you got red eye in your photographs, have at it, it's a great tool to do that. The next three are really important. The first is a graduated filter tool. The second is a radial filter tool. In other words, a, an oval or circular shape filter. And the last one is a filter brush. So for shapes that are not oval or rectangular, um, we use the adjustment brush. In this case, this is rather oval in shape. So I'm gonna choose the oval adjustment tool, the radial adjustment tool. And if I come over to the photo, I can drag out an oval on that photo that pretty much covers the area that I'm interested in changing. And up, up pops a series of controls that will just happen inside that oval. By the way, it's a little bit backwards. If you, you need to invert, there's an invert choice down here. You have to invert that to get the changes to happen inside the oval. If you don't click that, what it, what it will do is change everything outside the oval. So go ahead and click invert before we make our changes. And you can see I've got full flexibility now over exposure and contrast and everything else. So inside that oval, what are the problems we're facing here with this image? Well, it's kind of yellowy and green and uh, doesn't look like the rest of the image. So one thing, one approach I'll take is maybe desaturating that image from its color. Well, a lot of what's outside of it doesn't have much color either. So let's try just pulling some of the saturation out of that area. It actually does a pretty good job. It's still a little yellowy compared to the sun around it. So 
I'm going to take the temperature, the, the color temperature of it, and I'm going to slide that toward the blue side to get rid of some of that yellow tinge to it. And maybe I'm happy with that. I, I press done. And you can see now it's much less pronounced in the photograph. Now, I couldn't have done that a decade ago or two decades ago when I took this photo. The tool didn't exist. So it's a good reason for using a newer version of the software. All right. That's about all I want to do on this photo. Um, if you look at, obviously, the sun is completely blown out. And one way to tell is to turn on in the histogram, turn on that warning triangle for blown out highlights. And there's one over here for deep, deep blacks. Well, the sun, by its nature, shooting into the sun is going to be blown out. I may not even want to change that. If I do want to change it, I can simply pick up, for example, the highlights control and move the highlights down slightly. So it's not blown white, it's just quite bright, but not completely blown. When you print the photograph, uh, there is going to be some, a little, little tiny amount of ink that will be laid down in this area. And that's important because when you look at the photograph printed at an angle, if there's no ink in a certain area, it's going to be a different reflectivity. And you want some ink to be laid down in that area. So that's why I, I would pull the highlight from that region. All right. We have to keep moving, so um, editing other photographs. Let me pause for just a second and make a pitch for calibrating your screen. Um, I'm doing all of this work right now on a laptop on my MacBook Pro. And there are no notebook or laptop computers out there in the world that I know of that are really lab quality for editing photographs. If you want to critically edit your photographs, you need to use an external monitor plugged into your computer. And to do that properly, you need to calibrate that monitor so that the colors you're looking at are true, so that when you send it to the printer or you give it to someone else, the, the edits you've made on that photograph are true. So this is a pitch for calibrating your screen. Um, the simple calibrators work just fine, the ones from X-Rite. Um, the eye display calibrators or the calibrators um, that are the spider calibrators. Um, if you don't have one now, I encourage you to pick one up because the edits you make are only going to be as good as the calibration of your screen. All right, let's edit another photograph that might be a problem. Um, this is a photograph I took in Porto, Portugal, um, during the harvest of these, these wonderful port grapes. Uh, they bring all the all the grapes into these large cement uh, uh, tubs called lagars. And these are the locals going through the first crush of the, of the grapes. You can see they're up to their thighs in, in grapes and seeds and stems. Um, a fun photograph, but it's got problems. So let's take a look at that develop module. Uh, the first thing I see, that blue area, by the way, those are deep, deep blacks. Um, it's OK to have deep blacks in your photograph. Um, I find sometimes these warning triangles to be a little bit distracting, so I can turn them off. Um, so in plain English, what's wrong with this photo? Well, I think it's underexposed. So I'll pick up the exposure control and move that over to the right. And what I really want to focus on right now are faces, because after all, that's what we like to look at in photographs. That's what our eyes are drawn to. So I'll change the exposure so that the faces to me look natural. Now, I may end up blowing out other areas of the photograph. And in fact, if I turn on the water, warning triangle, I might start to see that up here. Um, but to me, the faces are important. So I'm going to increase the, the exposure there. Next, I'm losing some of the detail in the grapes in the lagar. So that's kind of in the shadows portion of the image. So I'm going to use the shadows control and just boost up a little bit of the shadows. Not so much that it looks like an HDR photo. I know there are some people who like to slide the shadows all the way to the right and the highlights all the way to the left. And then all of your photos end up looking like HDR, high dynamic range photos. So I'm just going to boost the shadows a little bit. And the highlights here are a little bit distracting. All that white in the background is a little bit distracting. So I am going to bring the highlights down just a little so that we get more texture on that wall. Well, those are some quick edits. I haven't moved everything in the program. I've, I've just moved a couple of sliders and 
right away we've in, we've improved that photograph. Let's do a few more. Um, here's one that I took in White Sands, New Mexico. Um, probably about 95 degrees, zero percent humidity, um, and they actually have you can slide on on a on a, a snow sled. You can actually slide down these sand dunes. Um, again, what's wrong with this photo? I think it's underexposed. I did that on purpose because it was incredibly bright that day. Um, you can see this was taken uh, at a 500th of a second at ISO 160. So um, it says F32. I don't think I was at F32. I think I was at F, at least at F4 or 5.6. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, increase the exposure because I know that white sand was really white. Um, sky looks pretty good to me. I'm interested in what he's doing over here, so uh, I'm going to use that new tool uh, by hitting the command key and zooming in, even though it's more than 100%, it's actually 600%. Um, there's a lot of shadow going on with him uh, that I'm missing some detail here. Now, I can do that as a global change, or I can do it as a local change. If I want to do it as a local change, I'll use the adjustment brush, which is the last tool on the right. And now, if I turn on the bottom here, show selected mask overlay, I can start painting on him. I can make the brush larger or smaller. Just start painting. This is a mask. And it's not painting red on your photograph, don't worry. Um, it's just painting a mask on him because I just want to change him. And the more careful you are with this, the better your results. Um, but I want to basically just boost up some of the shadow detail that we lost on on him. So that's that's pretty good. I'll include more of his hair there. I'll turn off the overlay. And now I can use that control, go over to the shadows area and boost up some of the shadows and maybe even some of the exposure on him. And then zoom back out and say done. And now we've really brought him back. So by hitting the ba the backslash key, the one just above the return key on the keyboard, if you press that once, it takes you to the original photo. Press it again, it brings you back to your changes. So right away, we've um, used the local tool, the local adjustment tool, in this case, the adjustment brush, to bring him back. Again, G for grid takes us back to uh, some other photographs. Let's take a look at something, um, a landscape. Oh, let's, let's take a look at this photograph, because it's um, uh, a, a typical photo you might take at a party. Um, this is a quick snap of some friends of mine at a, at a, at a dinner party. Um, again, using the develop control, what seems to be wrong with this picture? Well, clearly the white balance isn't correct, because I know that's a white tablecloth. So if I pick up the eyedropper, and I choose an area on here, maybe in the shadow, and click once there, now I've guaranteed that that's a neutral gray. And I can sort of see what's going on with the faces. But again, this photograph is probably a little underexposed. I'm going to increase the exposure here. These people are lit from above, so the shadows are a little too harsh. I'd like to boost up some of the shadow. And the skin tones to me are just a, a little bit too magenta. So one thing you might try is the tint control and slide the tint control in the in the opposite direction to magenta, which is in the green direction. So here I've improved the skin tones. I've neutralized the white neutral gray tones and increased the exposure. So you can see how, uh, how easy it is for Lightroom to do that. Now, um, if I want multiple versions of a photograph, let me show you how to do that. So here's a photo I took at Lights Park. Uh, this, this is uh, like a headquarters in Wetzlar. And uh, these kids were playing in front of the sculpture that was here. And you might have seen in the promo for this that uh, I did a combination color black and white rendering of this image. Well, I'd like to do that for you here and show you how easy, how easy it is to do it. But I want to do two different versions. So I'll have this photograph as one version. And then what I want to do is right click on the image. And about halfway down, there's a command called create virtual copy. That is going to create a second copy of the image. You can see it down here in the film strip. 
it's not actually two files on your hard drive. It's, it's still one file. It's just treated in two different ways in Lightroom. It's not taking up any extra hard drive space. And I didn't have to save as and, and remember which one I saved. So let's go to the first version. And we're going to make a develop change to this image by making everything except the reflection black and white. The way I would do that is to choose the radial tool, draw a shape that's roughly equivalent to the reflector. By the way, if I want to get rid of the bottom of this, we can do that too. But let's just for now do that shape. Um, and then making sure I'm working inside the shape with the invert command. Um, I'm going to, actually, I, I told you I was going to make the outside um, black and white. So I'm not going to invert this. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to desaturate the, the rest of the photograph, everything outside the reflector, and press Done. So that's one treatment of this photo. Let's do the opposite treatment on the virtual copy two. And again, create that shape. Move it around if you like. Rotate it if you like. Make it larger or smaller. And in this case, I will invert the tool and desaturate. And now I've got a black and white reflection on a color image. In this photograph, I have a color reflection in a black and white image. If I want to see them side by side, I press the Command key to select the second image, and then the C key for Compare. And you can move them around and zoom in and out as well. C is Compare. G gets you back to the grid. C is Compare. So now I've got two different treatments of the image, but I only have one original file. And it only takes up the space of one original file. You can create as many of these virtual copies as you, as you choose. One of the powerful parts of Lightroom. All right, we're just about out of time. And I've only covered the beginnings of how to edit your photographs. Um, let me briefly go through what you're looking at underneath this. There are detailed ways of managing tone, hue, saturation, luminance. There's a new color grading tool if you're uh, doing any work in video, for example. This is a way to control midtones in different ways. Um, that is going to be the subject of, an, of another talk. Um, the way to sharpen your images is here. You can uh, sharpen the entire image. You can see that. Um, and with different controls over sharpening. Uh, you can reduce noise in high ISO images using the luminance and color noise reduction sliders. Um, and you can even apply lens corrections because there's a database of lenses. I want to show you one example of that before we uh, move on. Um, this is a photograph I took in Reykjavik, Iceland with a GoPro camera. And you can see it's pretty severely warped um, because, it, uh, because of the uh, wide angle lens. But I can apply a profile correction for a GoPro. And in one click, it makes the, the image more rectilinear. Um, it, it automatically sensed what the EXIF data was. So uh, lens corrections are here. You can um, change the angle of the image um, with vertical corrections. You can even constrain the crop if you like. Um, so more tools down here for perhaps vignetting the, the, the edges in different ways. But that's pretty much, um, you're going to spend most of your time here in the basic panel. And I do about 99% of my image editing right here in Lightroom. So let me uh, stop there and see if there are some questions we can take before we all have to go. Oh, uh, man alive, Brad. There are so many questions. Uh, but, and you know what? Uh, with the ones we've answered live and the ones I've been trying to my I'm feverishly uh, typing away to answer uh, via text, we've answered actually over 50. Uh, and we still have over 40 left. So uh, sorry, everyone, we're not going to answer all these questions. But thank you. It's been a great response. Uh, I'll just ask two quick questions that, that people have asked the most about. Um, do you suggest, based on a few people asking about multiple catalogs, do you suggest or advise using more than one catalog? And I think I have an idea of what your answer is. So you're probably going to guess my answer is no. I don't like to use more than one catalog. Mm -hmm. Because Lightroom is so fast and efficient, I like to have access to all my photographs at the same time. Yeah, 
I, I fully support that. It's best to stick with one catalog. It's it's confusing to to switch catalogs, and uh, Lightroom does not actually perform at its peak. Um, and switching catalogs is also kind of slow and cumbersome. Um, and then the other all, all the other things you showed the select and candidate. Uh, a, a few more than a few people have asked about before and after. You know, just like starting with you know like seeing the view of before your image and and, and before you've made any changes, and then after all your changes. Yes, down in the lower left corner. Where, I, where it says compare, there is a choice for X, Y uh, before and after. Mm -hmm. So look, look at the pop down for there and it, it will say before and after. Yeah. So again, thanks everyone for all these questions. I know I'm sorry we couldn't get to, to, to many of them, but we did our best to answer so many in this kind of bite-sized uh, version of an intro, intro to Lightroom. Um, you know, so there are many, many topics with Lightroom we can go over and maybe there's more we can do, uh, in the future. Uh, what I thank you, Brad, the presentation was fantastic. And a lot of people are singing your praises, um, thank you. you know, to, to make this uh, fairly digestible, uh, and, and, and more approachable for an intro. Um, I want to let everyone know to definitely check out, uh, the International Leica Society, uh, of which, uh, Brad is, uh, is the vice president. Uh, International Leica Society, LHSA, you can also, you can find them at lhsa.org, uh, at leica.society on Facebook, and at Leica Society on Instagram. Uh, and uh, the, to, to be a member of the, of the LHSA, it's normally $60 for a one-year digital LHSA membership. For everyone here, uh, please check out the chat. We have the link there. Uh, there's a special promotion here where uh, Brad and his, and his uh, esteemed colleagues are offering uh, a digital membership of 15 months for the price of 12 months, which is a nice promotion for everyone here. So thank you and, everyone for sticking around. <laughs> Antonio, thanks. I just want to mention LHSA is the user community for Leica enthusiasts. And we have a lot of webinars and other um, Ask the Expert series and a whole bunch of benefits for people. We're all we're a nonprofit organization and we're completely a volunteer organization. So all those dollars go to programming that benefits you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very dedicated group of, uh, of enthusiastic and uh, and passionate and knowledgeable uh, Leica users and owners. Um, and if you enjoyed this program, uh, and if you want to see more like this, if you're interested in even uh, maybe some one-on-one -on -one tutoring or group programs with Brad and through the Leica Academy, uh, please contact academy at leicacamerausa.com uh, for inquiries. Uh, we are always evaluating uh, the, the feedback of of our users and, and, and fans. So we definitely want to hear from you because uh, we would be definitely looking into doing more stuff like this. It seems like everyone seemed to really enjoy this. Brad, can't thank you enough. This is very informative and very helpful and easy to understand. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. So thank you for your time. It, it's been my absolute pleasure. And I hope that I've inspired you to give Lightroom a try for your photos. Don't be afraid. You're not going to ruin your originals. Um, and, um, and come back for more. And if you want us to offer more, let us know through that email that Antonio shared with you at Leica Academy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so thank you again, everyone, for joining, for asking these fantastic questions. Uh, and until next time, we'll see you again on Leica Conversations. Take care, everyone.